Biophilia is the sort of natural affinity you have for nature. And I knew I had that from the very beginning. And my parents did the most important thing I probably in the, my life, and that was they took me out of the O'Keefe Elementary School, which was battleground, and, and put me into the University of Chicago Lab School. Most of my contemporaries at the lab school were rebelling against their academic parents, and I was loving it. The more academic, the better. The more books, the better. I just always had that attitude. But so in half of seventh grade, I went and signed up at the, left the lab school. I knew my parents wouldn't approve. My father would never approve. And I went and signed up at Hyde Park High School. I ended up going back to the college. You'd take the test, and they'd place you where you belonged. And it would be people in their 40s and, and people who were 14. And I was 14 when I went back. They said, you don't know anything, so we're going to give you the first year of sciences, physics and chemistry, and the second year of sciences. And science was in the air. And this is the days when, I mean, I remember the double helix was being talked about. And we went to these seminars we didn't really understand. But we knew that the idea of heredity was being understood. So I owe my education to two things, the University of Chicago and the fact that I met Sagan on the steps of the math department. He was uh, so already a hero because he was valedictorian in his class, and he was the head of the astronomy group, and he had introduced Chandrasekhar, who later won the Nobel Prize. And he was someone who was very interested in science, of course. And yeah, he, he taught me that, that People, ordinary people, which I thought was ordinary, could, uh, could access science. And so I, I learned a lot of the actual activities in the daily life in science. Science is an activity, first of all, international. I didn't realize it fully until much later, but it's an international activity where there's a consensus based on demonstrable evidence. And, and I think that just appealed to me extremely. That it's not a question of, I think this and you think that. And I just like that very much. But the amount of work required to do any kind of science at the professional level is usually daunting, in fact, discouraging. So people don't do it unless there's a lot of motivation. Sometimes the motivations are um, extraneous for these extraneous properties and kudos and all that. But I, I think that mostly they're not. I think most of the scientists I know can calculate, but they can't write and read. They, can, they all can calculate in some way. They uh, are socially very backward as a rule. They are dying to have attention somehow or other, will do anything for it. People are always asking me, who is your role model? Who is your woman role model? And I tell them, uh, I really didn't have one. I really didn't have a, a, as a role model that wasn't in a book. It wasn't a part of the book. You know, so I, I, I do, and they don't like that because they want to have role models, but I think that's just a lot of propaganda. It's because people can understand when it's got to do with people much more than if it's just the academic or the, um, the uh, intellectual object. We did a study on the Sonoran termite. It's called Teratermis occidentus, and it was just exemplary for me because we had to do the fact that they fly after the first... Uh, new moon in the spring when it rains. We had to do the ecology, and the ecology is Eastern California and the Sonoran Desert and Sonora, Mexico. And they live at 130 degrees Fahrenheit, and nobody, no other termites live in there. Anyway, the, the point of, of this is to say when we publish this uh, study, uh, a guy calls me up and says, you know, I'm, I'm covering your study and I want to write it up for something. And he said, I want to ask you something. This seems so 19th century to me because you've got it all together. You've got the ecology, you've got the microbiology, you have these electron micrographs of the details of the organisms inside, you've got it correlated. He said, people don't do that kind of science anymore. And as a result, I understand it. And I just wonder, why do you do that? And, and, I, and I said, and, and I say to anyone, because it's not science to me unless it's integrated. Unless it's integrated in such a way that it makes a story. That's, once you have a story, you have something you can tell other people. And a story that makes sense intrinsically. So I have this holistic view to begin with. When I started working with Jim Lovelock on the Gaia concept, it was a great privilege to work with him because he was also extremely holistic. I mean, he saw the Earth as a, as a, you know, as a 
whole, you call it ecophysiology, that is, the whole, as a whole entity, if symbiosis is simply the living together of organisms in the same place at the same time, in physical contact with each other, and that's all it is, if that's what symbiosis is, and symbiogenesis is when new emergent properties come from the living together, then Gaia, which is the whole Earth living system, is symbiosis as seen from space. Because the living together is through the atmosphere, the hydrosphere, the waters, the oceans, and they're all from a distance in physical contact with each other from the same time in the same space. I can't talk about cost-benefit or cooperation or competition because those words are proper for the banks and the basketball courts, but they're not proper for the scientific explanation. What I found, I mean, the intellectual thread here, which goes through the, through the um, Stephen Harding's book on animate earth, it's certainly all over Dazzle Gradually. Dazzle Gradually has this, has a, has a chapter in there which I'm most proud of, and I was, I was chastised, I was overtly criticized in front of the peers for it. It's called uh, something like Nietzsche's Pox, Spirochetes Awake, I forgot. It's got to do about, about spirochetes and syphilis and AIDS and stuff. But the, the idea is to have a holistic view that holds up from whatever point of view of whatever science it's being uh, examined from. Evolution is the key to everything I'm interested in. And evolution, the biological part of it, that is from the origin and the evolution and the history of life. Well, very early, but after I had a PhD, I recognized that there is, I had a PhD in genetics, why? Because I thought genetics was a quantitative and very definite way of learning about evolution. That genetics is what connects one generation of organisms with the next generation. And uh, so I thought, if I go into genetics, I'll be able to understand evolution. And I went into genetics as a genetics student at Berkeley, and I found, at the University of California, Berkeley, and I found out that those people didn't know the geological time scale. So I went over to the paleontologist, and I found that those people knew a lot about bones, but they didn't know anything about genetics. And then I went over to the bacteriology and viral laboratory, and I thought, and the thing that absolutely shocked me out of my wits is that they knew a lot about bacterial genetics, but the rule of bacterial genetics are completely different from the rule of Mendelian genetics. So that really got me totally aware of the need for the geological background, the need, the recognition that there are two kinds of life on Earth, there's the bacteria, which follow the bacterial rules, and everything else, which are animals, plants, protoctus, fungi. And, and I realized that the people working in it didn't know the fundamentals. So at the very beginning, Carlene Schwartz and I realized we needed a book that had all the organisms in it, all the higher taxa, which means all the larger groups of organisms. And so these essays represent really the battle between what's really known by people who know the details and the way that bleeds into things that are field chauvinistically isolated. There's a tendency to dichotomize and then believe the dichotomy that interferes not just with science, it interferes with everything, with all sorts of thoughts.